disciples, and after they had eaten, he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He replied, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Look after my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was upset that he asked him the third time, Do you love me? And said, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. I tell you most solemnly, when you were young, you put on your own belt and walked where you liked. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and somebody else will put a belt round you and take you where you would rather not go. In these words, he indicated the kind of death by which Peter would give glory to God. After this, he said, Follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The translation back into Hebrew has the same word each time. It only has the word for to love, a chav coming in there, partly because there is less variation possible in the Hebrew. But the Greek does distinguish, and one wonders why. If there is a deliberate distinction to be made between the verbs used, it will be in this vein. When the Lord uses the word, which we find in Greek as agapein, in his first two questions, he would be referring to the kind of love that comes in the will and the intellect, which characterizes precisely what is going to be this agape of the Christian community. But Simon Peter answers with what would be something of the heart. The root is philane, and philia is the love of friendship, and the heart is very much involved. I'm head over heels with you. 
it's a bonding of that nature, you know, Lord. And then the Lord still, according to the Greek, uses that agapan form, and then the second one is the same one used by Simon Peter, that is the philain form. But then in the third time the Lord uses the word of Simon Peter. And it is interesting that at that point Simon Peter becomes grieved, possibly because of, as it were, the need to have asked a third time. But in so doing, the threefold denial of Simon Peter is re-established, as it were, before it happened. The relationship is healed. And each time he's giving them these words of commission, and these two are changing each time. Two verbs are being used with regard to shepherding. And the distinction is made in the translation that we have here. Look after my sheep. <coughs> now, that is the verb of shepherding. Poimanein. Poimanein is a shepherd. And it can contain that notion of leading and governing. That's the second verb being used. The first one is voskane, and that is to feed. And that could mean, therefore, in the context, to feed with the word, and therefore to teach, the teaching role of Simon Peter. And there is also a distinction made between the type of animal. There is a crescendo. We have, first of all, the lambs, then we have the sheep, and then, third time round, we have the feeding of the sheep. Therefore, the fullness of the commission to teach his brethren the Petrine authority, that magisterial authority which has been picked up by the authors and has actually been put on the dome of the Vatican. In the time of the Reformation, the present Vatican Basilica of St. Peter's was constructed at great expense and a deliberate statement was made by placing in Greek over the dome itself in the dome right round, if one reads carefully, this Greek of the commissioning of Simon Peter. And it's deliberate to indicate that it is a universal one and it was picked up as such by the early popes. The, the Great and Gregory the Great both have a clear perception in their writings of their role as universal pastor and teacher. And indeed at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 there was an expression of admiration and great respect and reverence when eventually the Leonine letters were read and the spontaneous reply of the whole Eastern Bloc was Peter has spoken, and that carried the day with regard to the issue. Christology was crystallized as we have it in these early councils. And that one of Chalcedon was very important, the last in a great series of them. But it was always felt by instinct that truth was to be found precisely where Simon Peter was. And of course, when the present Basilica of St. Peter's was built, it was after not only the split with the East, but also the split within the West. And so there's a deliberate statement being made there. The universal role of Peter is being underlined. The whole of this Gospel follows the question of Simon Peter, what about this one? And the Lord giving this strange answer, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow thou me. And we have this same word coming here at the end of this gospel, follow me. So look at me and follow me. And of course he's got to follow him to the cross. Now we notice a little interesting oscillation between his old name, Simon, and the new name, Peter, coming in. The Lord each time uses the word Simon and then Barjona, which he's used before when he first of all commissioned him and gave him the keys. 
And also there's a parallel there between Son of Jonah and what he has already said, Son of God. Simon, Peter, has recognised the divine sonship. Here, there, we have the Lord recognising his humanity, but he's clinging to that here until the whole re-establishment of the relationship has happened. He uses three times the word Simon, son of John. But then, when the evangelist carries on, he uses Peter was upset. So he's using what has already been used in the apostolic band, of course the kephas is what they were using amongst themselves, the Aramaic form. And then, at the end, in these words, he indicated the kind of death by which Peter, Petros, would give glory to God. Of course it happened not in the Vatican, but it happened at the Mamertine Hill. We can still visit the place of martyrdom there, where he was crucified according to his own wish, upside down, because he felt he was unworthy die in the same way as his saviour. And underneath the place of his execution, by the crucifixion, because he didn't have Roman citizenship, one can visit the dungeon where he was kept before, underground. On this day we feast St Kevin in Ireland. He was from Leinster, this part, and he went down eventually after being ordained a priest to Glendalough. Now it seems that he was from a noble, even a royal family, that had been ousted. Therefore he was moving further away from his roots, but found a quiet place at Glendalough after ordination to the priesthood and settled there as a hermit. And without seeking it, he like a magnet drew, which is the classical pattern that we find also in the Desert Fathers. And afterwards, of course, it became a very important monastic centre and even Episcopal see. Now, we have interesting things coming through with regard to this saint. It would seem that he lived a very long time, maybe even over a century, and that he met, not long before he died, the other great saint founding at that time as well, St. Kieran of Clonmacnoise, and that the latter gave him his bell. It's interesting that these bells are still being used in the Christian world in East and West, and that they were important in the monastic life. They were the punctuation mark of time. And it is well to punctuate time as they did. The prayers of the liturgy of today referred to the night. He was happy to sing praises at night, and the night hours also are punctuated by these moments of keeping vigil. Very important in the monastic life. A monk is one who keeps vigil while the world is asleep, as a beacon, as a lamp, as the sanctuary lamp itself. But also silent prayer was very important, and these places of silence were sought out by them. Nature heals and invites to contemplation. Noise hampers it. And the place we live is not indifferent. If we have a choice, it is well to seek a place where there's physical silence and not to bring our own noise into it. In the Gospel, the Lord foretells that Simon Peter will extend his hands and another will gird him and lead him where he would rather not go. In the life of St. Kevin, there is this passage which indicates that he spent much time in prayer with outstretched hands, his own hands outstretched, which is quite a penitential position. And one tradition has it that a blackbird came along while he was in this position and managed to have time to lay an egg on one of his outstretched holy hands. And the saint nevertheless carried on in prayer mode and tradition is that he stayed there until the egg was hatched. These saints had a great rapport with the animals 
great and small. I forget whether it was St. Kieran or St. Kevin who was working on a manuscript and was called suddenly. And because it was difficult to find the place again, he asked a nearby fly to remain at that point where his finger was until he returned, and he did. It's the innocence of Eden found again. It's interesting, actually, that one does find that sometimes. The animals have a good relationship with people who are kind to them, children, good farmers, and they grow familiar. But we've had experience here that they seem also to have a notion of the presence. It's interesting that the birds seem to know and observe and wait and watch when Jesus is coming and going. Interesting. Do they know more than we think? This is the first Friday of the month of the Sacred Heart and we consecrate ourselves to that heart and ask that it will receive this consolation of preparation and that our prayer will make up for the absence of respect that oftentimes on earth he receives. The animals perhaps have greater respect than we do. It's interesting that dogs can sometimes really smell and sniff the real presence. They warn us, this is not a symbol. You are before the living God. Oh, sacred heart, our home lies deep in Say. Hey. 